morning everyone. Sorry for the late start, it was my fault. Uh, yeah, so my topic today is oh so close. And by the end of this discussion or this presentation, hopefully we're all going to figure out and all agree that it was oh so close. So our index patient presented to me on the 12th of January this year, 36 year old lady, she was a nursing sister, works locally in Tawniel Hospital. She was diagnosed with pulmonary tuberculosis in November 2022 based on sputum results. Of note history wise, she had COVID positive in January last year. She had one vaccine prior to that. She also told me she was HIV negative one year prior to this. I managed to trace her old chest x-ray. This x-ray was done when she was diagnosed with TB. This was November last year. We'll come back to that. So she now had a cough that was worsening, dyspnea for five days. She had been to a general practitioner who prescribed some antibiotics, but her cough worsened and she was getting more short of breath. Her cough was non-productive and she had no hemoptysis. On examination, she was a well-looking lady. She had no skin lesions, but she had auto thrush, she had shoddy cervical lymph nodes, she had no clubbing, edema, or jaundice. On examination, she was in respiratory distress again. She had a respiratory rate of 28 per minute. She was using her accessory muscles. She was not in heart failure. Her blood pressure was normal. She had a pulse of 106 that was regular. Abdominal examination was normal. A neurological examination was also essentially normal. Investigations, we proceeded to a chest X-ray, which I'll show you soon. It showed bilateral interstitial infiltrates. A full blood count showed a white cell count of four and a total lymphocyte count of 100. She had a CRP of 96, her UNEs were normal. Her liver function showed increased globulins with a total protein of 96 and an albumin of 22. Okay, so this was her, her chest x-ray. sure everyone can appreciate those interstitial infiltrates. And this is typical of PCP. So our clinical impression was an atypical pneumonia someone who had been diagnosed with pulmonary tuberculosis. She was on her third month of treatment. She was compliant. But I was concerned about retroviral disease because of the auto thrush, the shorty cervical lymph nodes, the increased globulins, and the decreased lymphocyte count. I ordered a CT pulmonary angio, which showed extensive interstitial infiltrates. There was no significant lymph nodes. Her HIV serology came back positive. She had a CD4 count of 10 and a viral load of about a million. Her blood gas at that stage showed a PO2 of 8, a PCO2 of 4, sets of 91% and a lactate of 1.6. I proceeded to order a CMB viral load, a fungital and a blood culture, also sputum MCNS AFB type 3, and I started an intravenous spectrum. On the 16th of January, the CRP showed a downward trend. 
she had decreased respiratory distress, she had good air entry, and we were waiting to find it out. So things were looking good. On the 17th of January, her sputum for PCJ, PCR came back positive. She had SATs of 97%, and her CRP had gone down to 63. On the 18th of January, she was improving. Her fungital came back as 355. And I proceeded to start on IV mycomine, knowing that the fungital could possibly be raised as a result of the PCP as well, but in view of the low CD4 count, we decided to cover her for fungal infection as well. On the 19th of January, her CRP continued to be on a decline trend. The CRP was 40. There was decreased respiratory distress. There was good air entry, and the chest was clear. On the 20th of January, this was day six spectrum. She had an increased CRP of 185. Her PCT decreased. Her SATs were 92%. She had an increased respiratory rate of 35. Her heart rate was 125. So I repeated a chest X-ray, and unfortunately that showed increased infiltrates. She then had to go into a rebreather. So the chest X-ray, and how much you can appreciate, but the infiltrates have definitely increased. So from the 21st of January to the 25th of January, we had worsening respiratory distress. She refused intubation. I think lots of the nursing staff here know her. And we all tried to convince her, but she refused. We then proceeded to high flow oxygen. On the 24th of January, she was in high flow oxygen at 60 liters in FL2 of 100%. Her PO2 was 14 and the PCO2 was 4 and a left rate of 1.4. On the 25th of January, we convinced her that she needed intubation. She wanted the nursing staff and myself to promise her that we would uh, extubate her soon. Uh, yeah, so her F out at that stage was 100%. She acquired triple inotropes, vasopressin was added, her pH was 6.84, her PO2 was 9.6, her PCO2 was 14, and a lactate of 6.1. That's when I phoned Dr. Fulton and I said, please help. Dr. Fulton is one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> please help. <laughs> Um, thanks, Devon. Um, yeah, anyway, this is just sort of, the, we're just going to briefly run through what happened with the patient um, and then a few pointers as we go along. Um, okay, um, anyway, we're talking, we're running through this with the headings of five critical moments because we don't want to overload with information and confuse ourselves. Essentially, the patient has a problem of um, acute cardiorespiratory failure. Um, when I was asked to see the patient, um, uh, there had been rapid overnight deterioration. Uh, and at that stage, the patient was on high doses of, of inotropes, um, you know, vasopressin and adrenaline and noradrenaline. Um, and those numbers there, as you know, it's a, a, a bugbear of mine. We don't have a dose maximum dose of, of uh, therapeutic inotrope. Therapeutic, I must say, it doesn't you can give as much inotrope as you like, but it stops being effective at certain levels. Noradrenaline, 67 mils, which is kind of a meaningless dose, but it's actually 0.7 mics per kilo. The adrenaline was about 0.65 mics per kilo, and the vasopressin was only a huge dose. So all of those drugs are not innocuous at that dosage level. And the patient had become, they said, oliguric, but relatively annuary. Um, blood pressure was 75 on 52, heart rate 149, SATs for 84 on 100% oxygen. And, uh, you know, PO2 of 10 and a PC2 of 14, a lactate of, of 6.1. And then you can see the, the, the blood gas there. Um, let me just take this silly thing off here. Um, but you know, largely not compatible with any long-term survival. Um, and that's the chest X-ray which um, Devin has showed you. So it comes down to what do we do for this patient? By and large, somebody with those figures would not be considered a candidate for any kind of intervention in that it's a hopeless case. 
Um, but we sort of, she was young, but a young family, previously completely well until this hospital admission. So we sort of, uh, and then I discussed it with Martin Sussman, who is the go-to guy for me for ECMO, and he felt that given her age alone, it was worthwhile uh, putting on to ECMO. And the question of VA or VV ECMO, these are the VV ECMO criteria, and um, what, what are we going to do with this patient? Well, it was fairly straightforward in that the patient had cardiac and respiratory failure. Um, so you basically need to put the patient onto cardiopulmonary bypass, which is what VA ECMO is, to support the circulation, to reverse the acidosis, and improve tissue perfusion and get the vasoconstrictors off. The vasoconstrictors are wonderful drugs for short, brief periods, but they kill the patients otherwise. So you, do they fit into the diagnostic groups? Are there any clinical modifiers and how do you make the decision? And so we would basically have called her for a VV ECMO, but this could apply for a VA ECMO as well, who was in circulatory failure, she had community acquired pneumonia and effect, infective cause, and that was a favorable diagnostic category, so we'd give her a score of one for that. And then they do say unfavorable diagnostic categories. They look at the bottom there, pneumocystis, Jurevetia, pneumonia. is considered unfavorable. And this is on the Alfred criteria. In South Africa, we've actually been quite successful with VV ECMO in pneumocystis patients. Um, but that's only been in two places. And I think, again, it gets back to the idea that ECMO should probably be done in a center and not be done as an occasional um, procedure in a hospital and because the, the outcomes are according. And then all the clinical modifiers you can see on the right there is a lactate more than 10, noradrenaline more than one mic per kilo per, kilo per minute. We were sort of almost at one mic. And that's just noradrenaline, that's forgetting vasopressin, so we were probably way over those criteria as well. Anuria for more than four hours, and the patient had basically been anuric overnight. So we kind of bent the rules a little here. And then you look at the absolute contraindications for ECMO, and this chart's quite easy to follow. You get scores according to um, the, the criteria on the previous slide. Um, and then the absolute contraindications, just to remind people that you don't put everybody on ECMO just to give them a chance, which I, uh, is not really um, an indication, but age is very important. Any severe irreversible condition, we shouldn't even consider ECMO. So, but these criteria are available on the, um, the Alfred ECMO um, website, and there's a uh, Everything is really available, so we don't need to reinvent the wheel. And as you can see, with our particular patient, she's less than 40 with a score of, of 1 to 2. You should consider, that they say, good expected outcome. And I think from the ECMO point of view, we'll see that that, that was appropriate. So we decided to put her onto VA ECMO through the femoral vessels, which we did in the ICU. And uh, that all was very orderly, um, and we were able to wean off those doses of iron traps. These are the notes from the WhatsApp group. As you can see, the blood pressure was holding off all vasopressors in a matter of hours. Um, and she needed transfusion, um, and she started to pass urine. Um, so that was within six hours of going on to ECMO. The pH had normalized. Um, and the oxygenation was satisfactory, see the SATs were 95, and we were able to wean the ventilation down to 40%, um, and lung, the ventilation, which we'll come to later. But that's the a screenshot of pulse of 101, SATs of 95, and the mean arterial pressure of 77. Now that trace might look a little bit alarming to somebody who thinks that 120 over 80 is normal blood pressure. For people on VA ECMO, they don't have a normal arterial trace, and a mean arterial pressure of 77 is in fact high for VA ECMO. I'm quite happy with a mean arterial pressure of 60. That's enough to perfuse and oxygenate the tissues because you're taking the load off the heart. So the, the ECMO machine 
is doing the work of the heart. And the patient was on volume controlled ventilation at the time, but again we'll come to that later. And then the second thing you'll see on the note, oxygenation slipped back to 82% and they've gone back uh, um, to 90% on lower ventilation pressure. Um, and this was the mixing cloud. And so it's a misinterpretation of the patient's clinical condition. When you're measuring the saturation in the right arm and the heart starts to eject blood as it recovers, it's going through rotten lungs. There's no oxygen in the lungs. So what comes out into the ascending aorta and then down the right arm is deoxygenated blood from the patient's own lung. So that's a large misinterpretation. It's a trap that people fall into if you're not familiar with ECMO. But this shows you the mixing cloud, which you can see um, if you look bottom uh, right-hand corner, the bad blood from the left ventricle is coming out as the heart recovers. So the heart's now recovered. It's starting to eject. It wasn't ejected because it was so, uh, myocardial function was so poor because of the acidosis and hypoxemia, and it recovers. And then, you know, there's a, a desire to start changing the ventilation. We still want to protect the lungs because the heart's recovered. Now we want to fiddle with the ventilation, which defeats the object of the ECMO in the first place. And on the left-hand side is you tolerate arterial, uh, reduced uh, arterial oxygen saturation, because the differential hypoxia is a sign of cardiac recovery, and large shunts are, are reversible. And they do not require much invasive uh, ventilation. You've got to optimize the ventilation. Don't go up with FiO2. And, We'll hear more about that later. You may need to change the, uh, the ECMO configuration. But that's also uh, something. But you can see quite clearly the mixing cloud caused a reaction. And then the question is when do we convert to VV? So we put the patient onto ECMO because of cardiac and respiratory failure. And there was rapid cardiac recovery simply because you reversed the metabolic milieu. And the, the cardiac function was good. So the patient was off inotropes, no support needed for the left heart, but, but we've got two ventricles. You mustn't forget about the right heart. And how do we know when to change? That's echocardiography, transesophageal ideally. And we found that this patient still had a stunned right ventricle. So the left ventricle recovers quickly. The right ventricle had not recovered because the lung pathology was still there. And then we decided to leave the patient on VA ECMO for several more days to allow for recovery. And this is just of interest. This is post ECMO insertion of inotropes on the left. You can see that's the ECMO flows, 3.6 liters. There's your blood pressure in the screen uh, showing systolic of over 100, SATs of 93. And we're off ECMO, so we turned the ECMO off, which you can see there with the red line, flows of 0.8. And you can see the blood pressure is maintained. So we knew the left ventricle had recovered. And then this is the echo that we did. And if you look um, on that uh, left screen, the top is the right ventricle, the bottom is the left ventricle. So I'm just going to play the video. And you can see the left the ventricle is contracting well, the right ventricle's not working. All right, so we, that's why we decided to leave the patient on ECMO, a VA ECMO. Then another problem started to arise, hemolysis. It was reported as hematuria. When the urine it starts to look like a bad red wine, then you know that the patient's hemolyzing most likely, although hematuria is possible, but someone who had, started, had clear urine initially and so then your concern is, is there, are the clots in the circuit? Is there a pipe head problem? And is anticoagulation that? So uh, your ideal test is plasma-free hemoglobin, but it takes us 12 to 24 hours to get a result to AMPA. Um, and then the LDH, which is a surrogate for that, was over 2,000. So the patient was, um, uh, was definitely hemolyzing. So we optimized anticoagulation, uh, things didn't improve, and the hemoglobin was falling, so the hemolysis was significant, and there was no evidence of bleeding. So we then decided that the patient needed circuit change. 
And at that stage, we decided rather than just change the circuit, we've had a few more days that the, the ventricle should have recovered, and we changed um, to VV ECMO. What does that mean? That we took the cannula out of the femoral artery and put one in the other femoral vein. So now the patient had two cannulae in the femoral, femoral venous circulation, one in the right heart and one in the inferior vena cava. So we're taking the blood out of the IVC and returning it to the right atrium oxygenated. And uh, the hemolysis improved um, uh, dramatically initially. Um, the chest x-ray improved. Uh, but over the next few days, and we were able to wean the ECMO. And this was the, the gas on the right there is the, where the ECMO was almost weaned off. The sweet gas was one, which is the gas that we used to remove carbon dioxide. Oxygenation was excellent. But then the patient started to hemolyze again. Um, and so we removed the ECMO perhaps 24 or 48 hours prior to which would have been ideal. The patient was on full lung protective ventilation um, and we sort of had a precipitous ECMO removal. And then the big question after that, we've still got to look after the lungs um, because there was such a, a huge improvement. And I think you can appreciate that on, on the chest x-ray as you saw from Dr. Gamba and from this chest x-ray. This is just always my plug on this thing about, about why, why use APRV. Well, I don't know whether you can recognize the gentleman in the top left-hand corner. Um, that's Guy Richards, who I think is, is quite smart, certainly a lot smarter than me. And this is I stole from one of his talks. And this was during COVID, and obviously we had a huge number of ARDS patients. And he said, we use APRV early, and most studies show physiological benefit and improvement in oxygenation, sedation use, hemodynamic variables, and respiratory mechanics. But no studies have shown decreased mortality versus conventional protective ventilation. And it's well referenced there. Yeah, and uh, any questions about the case before Bruce takes up the throne? Yeah. yeah. As far as timing of the introduction of the ECMO team, when would you have preferred being introduced to this patient? Look, I think that the earlier the better. There's no, there's no doubt about that. So I think that the, the, the triggers for, say, VA ECMO um, should be increasing inotrope requirement. Ideally, in the setting where you're monitoring the patient's cardiac output, but that's not always possible. So for VA ECMO, so if your inotropes are continuing to escalate dose, what the alpha has put on their protocol, what they get called for is anybody on whose adrenaline dose is 0.2 mics per kilo per minute and increasing. Um, and so they, they have a shock team approach. So the team goes to look at the patient and then they're aware of the patient and the patient gets reviewed frequently over the next few hours. And so if there's ongoing de deterioration, the ECMO is initiated prior to end organ damage from island trip. In the VV ECMO, it's the same thing. Once you start in, uh, have problems with uh, CO2 retention and acidosis, pH less than 7.2 and your CO2, and it's all uh, respiratory or injurious ventilation, which Bruce will tell us about people with an acute deterioration and you're having to use injurious ventilation, very high driving pressures in order to just maintain um, very high FiO2s, certainly 80% and above in a, in a person with white lungs and the usual ventilatory mechanic problems. So early referral is better. You're not going to put them all on ECMO. But changing the ventilation and the, the two podcasts that I suggest everybody listens to by Gary Girls, where they were able to, through appropriate ventilation, turn down nearly 90% of the ECMO referrals just because, uh, just because they want to change the ventilation. Um, so I think but this lady was on ventilated for about 12 hours. Yeah. But the reason why I asked the question is, and I specifically put it in my presentation, is day six back to this happened. Yeah. So to me, you know, 
it's the inflammatory process mm -hmm. for PCP specifically now that caused the decline. And you know, I, I saw it happening, I saw it going to happen. Mm -hmm. So my question is, you know, especially for PCP, maybe we should have predicted this earlier, mm -hmm. and yeah. even much earlier. <coughs> Well, she was reluctant to be ventilated, but uh, when, when patients go on to high flow and deteriorating chest radiograph, I think that should send a warning signal that this patient is going to deteriorate. Although she refused to be intubated, but she was on high flow for probably about 24, 48 hours, the radiographic deteriorations were evident there until that the section. I mean, until the time that you can't really, uh, uh, you have to offer ventilation to kind of protect the lungs. So, uh, could it be earlier? Two or three days earlier? Yeah. See, out of that presentation, I didn't discuss it, but what I wanted people to realize is that the trend of the CRP was down, and she was getting better. And the CRP remained down, but then she started getting respiratory distress. So everything was inflammation. What about uh, uh, CD4 count was 10? Yes. Um, the induction of ARVs? No. We started off. started off. Yeah. Yes. Start That's start a debate as well. That was a yes. question, and I, and I spoke to several specialists about it as well. Mm -hmm. And no one was brave enough to say starting ARVs. Mm -hmm. Because if you read most of the ECMO studies for PCP, mm -hmm. they've been done in patients with IMS, mm -hmm. in overseas. Mm -hmm. And patients start ARVs, <coughs> into the PCP, and then possibly need it. So, but it's, it's a catch-22 situation for everyone, because remember you've got a CD4 count of 10, mm -hmm. you've got no immune system, mm -hmm. and we're now subjecting you to ventilation. And this lady, the lady ultimately died mm -hmm. of opportunistic infection <coughs> from HIV, a CD4 count of 10. I spoke to, I spoke to you saying, and to eventual infectious disease and, and uh, pulmonology. And they were in agreement that once we had the patient on ECMO, that's the time we should start the ARVs for that very reason that then she's going to wind up getting some hospital acquired infection. So we, once we had her on ECMO and she was she had five or six days of, of ARVs and actually got better. So she didn't get an immediate iris catastrophe at that stage. I've got a question for Renee. I know that Alfred says age cut off 75. Now, in 75. 75. 65's got the red block already. Oh, I Absolute see. Absolute contraindication is 75, but 65, we'll go yeah. back with you. Yeah. Uh, with your experience in Mopar, do they actually put anybody age over 65 no. or 75 on ECMO, BB, no. or BF? No. No. We'll go outside. But I think I think the, the, there's always potential outliers, but as a general rule, um, no. Okay. But and then anyway, that's no no more questions. You know this. I I, I know I harp, harp on about this stuff, and obviously we spend a lot of time on on ECMO um, ourselves, and there's a lot of really good information. There's the Alfred ECMO guidelines. Which I think everybody who looks after an ECMO patient, you can download it and put it on, and you just can open it and get all the information. There's ED ECMO, um, who it's a, it's a, a podcast from, from the States, and it's, but it's global. They have global, they even had a South African on there, the Dutch on, um, and they go through all the latest studies, like the Inception trial, which has recently been published, and then the other one is MCRIP podcast, um, which is the one about, about ventilation. And then that alpha intensive block. But yeah, that's just sadly, I mean she got off ECMO and she actually did quite well for what about two weeks afterwards and then demise. So she was off ECMO. So we say that the ECMO run was we could say it was successful, unfortunately uh, not good for patient time. I just wanted to um, make two comments. Um, to me, the ECMO is basically a pause button, okay? You still have to reverse the cause of why the patient landed on ECMO. ECMO is not gonna cure the patient, but once you're sort of getting into a corner and you're starting to feel like you're in checkmates, that's the time you need to think of ECMO. Things are deteriorating and it's a reversible cause and the patient is 
under 65 years old and you're not sure, you can refer to those guidelines or call the ECBO team to come and assess. Okay. You don't have to know everything about it. It can be an inappropriate referral, but ask for help and make sure that there's not another move. The inotropes is not the last move. All right. And once you're just going up and up and up and there's no more therapy to reverse the cause, that is where you need to think you need to pause button here. Okay. The other thing I just wanted to say, I, I wanted to give a shout out to the St. Anne's nurses. Um, I think you guys did very well on this ECMO run. The patient developed no infection during the ECMO run, and she was at such huge risk for it. <coughs> um, but I, I just wanted to ask you guys, because we didn't see her afterwards, did you carry on with the IPC practices once she was off ECMO? Yes, we did. We did carry on. Yes. The whole time. Yes. I think you guys do very well. Thank you. And I think everybody learned a lot. Yeah, you had BV, you had VA, you had the whole shebang, hemolysis, everything. Now I now you know why we call it all so close. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it, yeah, it, it, yeah. It's like the operation of success but the patient died, you know, it's not it's, it's really but I think that we've got to hang on to the fact that the ECMO itself did do its job. And it'll, it'll do its job better if we, if we can get in sooner. Even six hours sooner makes all the difference. The Alfred shock team protocol refers to ECMO within 20 minutes yeah. of a cardiogenic shock. Bloody Alfred. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Our next expert. <laughs> so I'm Bruce Kilpatrick, one of the anaesthetists, uh, for those who don't know me. Um, you can't stay neutral. What? You yeah. have to unmute. <laughs> okay. Um, when I saw the presentation, I kind of inserted myself in the space, so apologies for that. Um, <laughs> I am um, going to uh, well, I'm going to talk about lung protective ventilation but I find myself going down a rabbit hole. So I'd actually like to do this in two parts. Uh, there's a big a lot to cover, and I think to cover the basics first, we'll get everyone on the same page, and then at a follow-up, if I haven't bored you to tears, we'll discuss lung ventilation on ECMO. So it's a little bit of a sidebar, if you don't mind. Um, so my aim today is just to talk about some of the aspects around lung damage and then the strategies to prevent lung damage. And then the second two, the last two ventilation modes and lung protective ventilation, ECMO will do for another time. Otherwise we'll be here till the afternoon. Sorry, but that didn't project very well. But some terms that you'll hear or bandied about are ventilator-induced lung injury, ventilator-associated lung injury, and silly, which I hadn't heard until recently, is spontaneously-induced lung injury. And that's certainly something that came to light during COVID, and we'll touch on that a little bit longer. So silly is basically excessive tidal volume generated by the patient that causes lung injury. Um, don't worry too much about the definitions, just as long as you're aware of the terms. So if we talk about ventilation, I um, just wanted to give you some background physiology. So the top left is someone breathing spontaneously. So when you take a breath, You've got negative pressure in your lungs, and there's high pressure in the atmosphere, and air goes into the lungs. Um, something you may have heard of is a transpulmonary pressure, and that's not something we easily measure, but it's the difference between the pressure in the alveolar and the pressure in the pleura, and that determines how the air gets into the lungs. So you've got the person on the left, their transpulmonary pressure is negative eight, and that's, sorry, positive eight, and that's normal. That's someone, you and I, in this room. In the middle, there's someone healthy, being ventilated uh, on mechanical ventilation. And again, the numbers are pretty much the same. Then you get into pathology. Someone who has a stiff chest wall, then um, you're ventilating against this very stiff bag. The actual lungs may be normal. In that case, the transpulmonary pressure is again normal. Um, we'll come back to that. Something that's always interested me, so someone who's playing a trumpet, their airway pressures are 150 millimeters of mercury, but they don't damage their lungs. 
Well, there is a caveat. There are some uh, ash reports of pneumothoraces. But basically, yeah. why are they not damaging their lungs? Because they're compensating and they're transpulmonary pressure um, with the pleural pressure decreasing so much remains essentially normal. So these are very key points. But it's something that we need to think about when we're ventilating our patients. And then you've got someone at the bottom who's in a bad way. Uh, so our COVID patients or ARDS patients, then their uh, times pulmonary pressure starts to go up. And that's when you start getting injuries. So just to define it for yourselves, the times pulmonary pressure difference between the pleural space and the alveolar space. And the reason it's important is that accurately uh, reflects the stress on the lung parenchyma. So the only thing we measure really at the bedside is the airway pressure. We don't measure the pleural pressure and therefore we cannot get the transpulmonary pressure. And it's independent on the chest wall compliance. So all our big obese patients, you ventilate them, their airway pressures are sky high and you think this is bad. It can be, but it can also, they can have normal uh, transpulmonary pressures because you are not compensating for that massive chest wall that's pushing on the lungs. There are ways experimentally of measuring it. So you can put a esophageal uh, probe down that's got a balloon and the esophageal pressure is analogous to the uh, pleural pressure. Uh, it's technically difficult. <coughs> there are some ventilators that allow for it. I haven't seen it myself. Um, so it's technically difficult to give you a one-off measurement. It doesn't give you uh, continuous measurements. And there are some differences uh, based on where you are in the esophagus. So your transpulmonary pressure is not uniform. It depends where you're at the top of the lungs or the bottom of the lungs. So there's lots of technical issues with actually getting the number. And I just want you to remember the, the concept. So what are the mechanisms of lung injury that we are aware of? There's volume trauma over-distended alveolar, barotrauma, high pressures in the alveolar, atelect trauma, so trauma from the alveolar being collapsed, we'll go into that one. And then very importantly, biotrauma. Um, so if we just talk about volume trauma to begin with, that, that's reasonably uh, easy to understand. If you over-distend the alveolar, you stretch those alveolar, you cause shear stress on it, it causes an inflammatory response. You can mechanically disrupt the alveoli and um, obviously uh, you affect gas exchange that way. Pressure can have similar effects as well, but uh, barotrauma can also cause bronchial fistula, pneumothoraces. We saw quite a lot of pneumothoraces in COVID patients, and you often see it in PJP patients as well. Um, Atelect trauma, if you think on a paper clip, if you open and close a paper clip again and again and again, the paper clip fatigues and breaks. The alveolar are the same. If you keep on having a closed alveolus and then open and close, that stresses the alveolus and that's atelect trauma. Um, so there are ways of avoiding that. And then all of this sets up an inflammatory cascade. I don't know if that project's big enough. If you look at the bottom, you get all these inflammatory mediators. I won't bore you with the names. Some of them we've seen before, especially in COVID, we measured IL-6, but there's this inflammatory cascade that's set up by the mechanical injury to the alveolar. And that can affect the rest of the lung, but very importantly, it can affect the rest of the body. It cascades into the systemic circulation, and there's quite good evidence that it uh, sets up an inflammatory cascade in the small intestines and in the kidneys. And quite interesting, depending on the degree of stress on the alveoli, uh, you can set up the process and death of cells. And that translates into the other organs, which is why you can see multi-organ failure purely from lung injuries. So what strategies do we have? Um, well, you can avoid IPPV. Remember we said you and I are breathing, we create a negative pressure in the lungs, and air goes from a higher pressure in the atmosphere into our lungs. With mechanical ventilation, we are driving pressure in with positive pressure. So it's the opposite of how you can now breathe. So it's not really physiological, and that leads to a lot of problems. We can have lower tidal volumes and lower airway pressures. We can use PEEP and the open length concept, which I'll discuss as well, positioning, and then ventilator mode. We're not going to discuss ventilator mode today. 
Important to know definition, definitions. So you'll see these terms ARDS and ALI. ALI is acute lung injury. It's all a continuum. Um, so there's criteria in terms of timing. Uh, and then the most important thing is your oxygenation levels. So we use the PF ratios, the ratio of how much oxygen you're the fraction of inspired oxygen and then the oxygen concentration in the uh, There's a slight incorrect there, it should be uh, you know, I forgot the FI2 and the acute lung injury. But anyway, below 300 with clinical signs and XO signs, and so don't worry about the weight pressure. That's there to say that this is not caused by a cardiac cause specifically. So it's isolating the problem to the lungs. So if you've got cardiac failure with palm, acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema, it's not an acute lung injury by definition. It can lead to it, but that's the distinction. So ARDS, there's lots of definitions. There's consensus definitions. These are the Berlin criteria. Again, it's just um, mm -hmm. looking at your PF ratios to determine how severe your ARDS is. One plug as such or something to do at the bedside. You saw a lot of the um, criteria that Dr. Fulton presented for ECMO um, and having numbers and something to hang your hat on at the bedside as to what to do next. Certainly something I find very interesting and it's very easy to do, you just plug it into your calculator on, uh, there's lots of medical calculators online, and it's oxygenation index. And it's looking at um, airway pressures, your inspired concentration of oxygenation and your PaO2. Plug it into the formula and it spits out a number. And your oxygenation index based on the numbers, pretty much pretty robust data gives you, you know, if it's low, you have a good outcome. If it's in the middle, you have quite a significant mortality. And above a certain number, you should start considering ECMO. Why I like it and why I found it very useful during COVID was that your ventilation modes and your patient changes day to day, hour to hour. Oxygenation index gives you a way of taking all those changes out of the equation. Your FI2 may have changed, your ventilator mode may have changed, but your oxygenation index will still give you a number to determine what's happening with that patient. So it's pretty robust. Uh, it doesn't matter what ventilation mode you're on. If it goes up, that's bad. If it goes down, it's good. And it's very easy to do at the bedside. Uh, so avoid IPPV. Uh, well, is that really an option? Um, I put this in here, this is an iron lung from the polio days. And so it's a negative pressure ventilator. You put the patient in there, it's clamped around, this is a more modern version, around the patient's chest and then uh, creates a vacuum inside that container and the lung expands. So it's a much more physiological way. Obviously I'm being a little bit flippant here, I'm not going to start doing iron lung ventilation in the ICUs. Uh, and it's got a very specific uh, application nowadays. But um, it does make you think a little bit. Um, so non-invasive ventilation, um, we saw a lot of it again in COVID. It's an all-encompassing term. We we're talking about high-flow nasal oxygen or high-flow nasal cannula and CPAP. The two are quite different, but they still fall under the same heading. Pre-COVID days, I don't want to go down this rabbit hole of when to use it in COVID, but pre-COVID days, there are specific indications for CPAP uh, where it's proven to be of benefit. And that's COPD exacerbations, cardiogenic pulmonary edema, so pulmonary edema from uh, heart failure, uh, obstructive sleep apnea, and hypercapnic respiratory failure when your CO2 is going up. Uh, beyond that, we sometimes use it as what I call intubation foreplay in ARDS patients, but um, the evidence for using it there is not particularly good. And something that's very important to realize is that it's not innocuous. So CPAP is using pressure and volume to base, basically uh, invasive ventilation or IPPV without an endotracheal tube. And we saw it in COVID. There's <coughs> quite good data that if you are, the patient's awake, on CPAP, generating tidal volumes more than 9 mls per kg, we're at very high risk of causing patient-induced uh, spontaneous uh, lung injury. So it seems a bit unfair to blame the patient <laughs> for causing their own injury, but it is driven by the patient's efforts. And there's some evidence that we should be maybe intubating these patients earlier 
so that we can control the ventilation better and get a, a more safe mode of ventilation. Um, low tidal volumes and low airway pressures, this is our mainstay. So I encourage you to read the ARDSNET study. This is what sort of has based all our lung ventilation strategies going forward, 2002 in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, and they compared low tidal volumes with uh, traditional tidal volumes. So traditional tidal volumes were 12 moles per kg. To put that in perspective for a 70 or 80 kilogram person, that's approaching one liter of breath. And I'm sure to everyone in the room that seems very high be quite worried if you saw a patient on that. But anyway, this is 20 years ago now, uh, 12 moles versus 6 moles. So 6 moles is your lower tidal volumes, obviously, and keeping your plateau airway pressures below 30 centimeters of water. We stopped the trial early because the mortality benefit was so marked. So we're talking about a mortality rate of 31% versus just under 40. Now 31% is still pretty high. That's why ARDS patients, so it's obviously quite a significant disease. Um, and then ventilated free days were obviously much uh, greater in the lower tidal volume group. So that's our baseline. These are just the, the modes they use. So tidal volumes, airway pressures, um, and then they had a titration for the peak, which we'll spend a little bit more time on as well. How does this translate into what we do in the, not just an ICU, but in the operating room? Um, it's a little bit cut off, but anyway, taking this from sick patients into healthy patients having anesthesia or patients in ICU are not ventilated for their lungs specifically, maybe they've got a head injury or things like that. And it's been shown, there's very good animal data that physiological ventilation um, can damage healthy lungs. And so if you ventilate anyone in this room with higher tidal volumes for an extended period of time, you will cause lung injury, even though your lungs are normal to begin with. It's also been shown in animals that using lung protective ventilation in non-injured lungs, in the absence of the primary pulmonary insult, can also cause damage. So even with our best intentions, with the best ventilation, you are still causing an injury. Obviously there's no there's strategies to ameliorate that, but there's no way of getting around and not ventilating. I'm not advocating that we don't ventilate patients. But I'm just trying to make the point that even if we do our best, you are still ventilating the lung, no, injuring the lung. So let's talk about PEEP. We all know what PEEP stands for, positive airway, positive end expiratory pressure. There's intrinsic PEEP, that's PEEP patients generate on their own. It's important in COPD patients. They generate a lot of auto PEEP. Intrinsic PEEP is a PEEP we apply. You'll see in the literature lots of articles about low PEEP, high PEEP. It changes all the time, so I don't counsel against using those terms. I think what's, again, with anything we do, what is optimal PEEP for the patient we're dealing with? The whole aim of PEEP is to avoid that eta trauma, the eta lattices, and that paperclip model. So to bore you with some physiology, any time on the ventilator, and you can get this on some of the ventilators, but this is a pressure volume curve. So there's pressure on the x-axis, volume on the y-axis. As air gets pushed in, there's that sigmoid curve that we see so often in physiology. It's a sort of lazy S. At the bottom of the S, this point here, is called the low inflection point. So you give pressure into the lungs, nothing's happening for volume, then the lungs open. And your volume starts to go up in a linear fashion. You want to start your breath here. You're starting here, using a lot of pressure to open the lungs, and you're causing that. That's is, this is from atelectasis and atelectroma. So if you can get your peak to a point where you start your breath here, that's ideal. You can, on certain ventilators, get these graphs. Obviously, in a patient who's not breathing spontaneously, usually paralyzed, it's very easy to get these numbers in the theater where you have absolute control. It's a little bit more difficult to get that in the ICU where things are changing. But conceptually, that's what we want to do with PEEP. And you want to avoid being at this side of the curve as well. And this is where, above these pressures, you're getting an increase in pressure, but you're not getting a change in volume. And uh, on certain, certainly in the ICU, in the theater ventilators, 
you can see on the spirometry curve, you get a bird beaking. So you get this long beak where the pressure's increasing, but the volume isn't. And that's uh, where you're gonna start causing aerotrol. So there is some science to what we do. This leads us to the open lung concept. You'll see it a lot in the literature. There's some very good articles on it. Basically, the concept is instead of opening and closing the lungs all the time, you keep the lung open uh, and avoid that the sheer stress. Uh, how do you do that? By recruitment maneuvers. So you apply constant pressure to the lung and hold it, often for 45 seconds to a minute at a certain pressure. There's numerous techniques. Don't worry about the actual nuts and bolts of it. And then you keep the lung open with a higher peak. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to trade off that eight lap trauma when the lungs collapsed versus body trauma when the lungs overexposed, uh, overexpanded. I'll read it to you. Um, so the ART trial was a atelectasis um, recruitment trial. Um, fairly recently in the 2000s, over about five years, um, it was a randomized controlled trial over in 120 ICUs in nine different countries. Um, and what they did is they recruited patients to a normal PEEP strategy versus a recruitment and a higher PEEP strategy. And um, the risk of barotrauma, the risk of mortality, the risk of pneumothorax, and the risk of decreased number of ventilator free days was higher. So all the bad things was higher in the recruitment than the high peeps are. So you can certainly make your numbers look better and increase your oxygenation with our open lung and high peep strategy, but there's significant trade-offs. So what is high peep 2025? Again, there are certainly going to be some patients who benefit from that, but overall for your most ARDS patients, uh, there's quite strong data that you're going to cause more harm uh, than a routine PEEP uh, strategy. Uh, this is a fairly good um, review of that article, so if you, uh, you don't have to read the full um, article on the trial, but just on the, um, the editorial. Um, and get to know me, one of the last names is a, a sort of doyen in this area. Um, so they, the trade-off is keeping the lung open, volume trauma, and like anything in medicine, the answer is somewhere in the middle, uh, but high PEEP probably is injurious. Um, how do you apply PEEP? People like that are in all these big studies, they are doing recruitment maneuvers, doing CT scans before and after, and looking at the degree of uh, recruited lung. So obviously it's very labor intensive, um, not something we're not going to be carting our patients off to the CT scan after every recruitment or every change in PEEP, or certainly on mode. But um, there are some um, tables and strategies, certainly from the ARDSNET group, on how to apply PEEP. But basic principles are when your FI2 is going up, you should consider putting up your PEEP as well. And then the upper limit is 24. This is from up to date. Uh, positioning is a very good strategy. Uh, so what we're talking about is proning patients. Um, so there's very good physiological reasons for proning patients. Um, basically, when you are supine, you are over distending. There's your patient at the top supine. The non-dependent alveoli are getting all the pressure from the ventilator and are over distending. The dependent alveoli in that boggy lung everything's on top of it, can't expand, or be <laughs> under-expanded. Your blood flow is preferentially uh, going to the bottom by gravity, and less preferentially to the top. So that's a BQ mismatch. Your ventilation and your perfusion is mismatched, which is why you get hypoxia. Put the prone, and you can help that BQ mismatch substantially. So you preferentially then ventilate those alveoli that were dependent, they now become above, and your, your, your blood um, effusion doesn't change as much, so you start to improve your EQ mismatch. Also, your heart is then now dependent, it's not resting on the rest of the lung, so there's very good physiological benefits to doing it. Um, important to remember that when you're prone, 
you have to have your abdomen free. If your abdomen is constrained, then you are not getting any benefit of pushing the diaphragm up and uh, you, are, you are back to square one. Uh, there's lots of contraindications. Um, obviously, you've got to have a relatively stable patient, um, no hemodynamic instability, no stenotomy, um, no raised intracranial pressure. Um, and complications are significant. We did prone a few of our patients during COVID. It's extremely labor intense. The risk of removing lines and tubes is huge. Uh, pressure sores is a significant issue. We saw it in one of the other hospitals and a patient who was awake um, with CPAP and they got a significant pressure sore. So it's not without risk, um, but certainly, you know, we spoke about calling an ECMO team and optimizing some of these things before going on ECMO is, is a potential um, intervention that we can do. Um, it's a very interesting prospective randomized trial called the ProSumer trial, uh, looking at Cronin. And what they did is they randomized a subset of ARDS patients who fit the criteria um, to proning. And their mortality difference at 28 days was for non-proning patients, 33%, for prone patients, 16%. And a 90-day mortality was 24% for prone patients, 41% for non-prone patients. They were proning patients for 73% of their ICU stay. So that's not just for a couple of hours, it's not just for 24 hours, it's for a huge proportion of their intubated stay in ICU. Some caveats with this, uh, also um, the prone group needed less rescue therapy, so less ECMO, 1 versus 2.6%, and less inhaled nitric oxide. Um, some caveats with this trial, these were done in European centres that were very experienced in proning patients, they got proning teams, so I'm not advocating we prone every patient here. I'm very aware of our uh, resource limitations. And I think first do no harm should be our mantra, uh, but certainly it should be something to consider in our patients. So this is project suits as well. So probably just a good place to summarize things. Um, what can we do? before we get to the ECMO stage. So there's prone positioning, all the potential benefits. Uh, there's appropriate PEEP to prevent atelectoma and biotrauma. There's low tidal volume ventilation, which kind of is our baseline standard at the moment and very well validated. Uh, optimizing our driving pressures, whether there's a role for measuring the transpulmonary pressure, certainly being aware of it, uh, in patients who are obese and have other chest wall issues. Um, being aware of the biotrauma and the potential multi-organ failure that that can cause. And then obviously, the bottom here is the extracorporeal te techniques that you can have, um, which leads us into the second part of our talk, which would be ultra-lung protection ventilation strategies on ECMO. Just a quick while we've got some time, uh, is how do we extrapolate these lung protective strategies into cardiothoracic anesthesia? And there's a few, three uh, points that um, it comes up. Thoracics, in particular in one lung ventilation, we're not going to talk about that in this forum. In cardiacs, and cardiopulmonary bypass, and then obviously in patients on ECMO. A quick look at cardiac patients on cardiopulmonary bypass. Their incidence of ALDS is fortunately very low, less than 2%, but if it happens, look at the mortality. So this is something that we really want to avoid. Causes are multifactorial, as is everything. So it's the surge response from the surgery, it's the surge response from the ECMO, the CPV circuit, direct trauma from the surgery, transfusions. Um, the take home point here is, these are at risk lungs and applying the lung protective strategies to these at-risk lungs is very important. There's evidence of that, so these are 
One can all the other large specimens of post op cardiac patients, post cardiac pulmonary bypass. So they're just measuring inflammatory mediators in the lungs. And you can see pre bypass, essentially zero, post bypass with lung protective ventilation, up and low, six hours post CPB with um, injurious ventilation. This is, so this is being ventilated with. 11 moles per kg, and that's 8 moles per kg. So if you ventilate at risk lungs, you're going to cause support. And I think that's... Finally, we won't go into it at the moment. That's transfusion-related lung injury. But I think for our next talk, if you'll have me back, <laughs> so I want to <laughs> say... Thanks, Mr. <laughs> I want to segue into the ventilation modes, and how they apply in ECMO. So we'll discuss volume control, pressure control, APRV, and then ultra-protective lung ventilation on ECMO. So not quite as advertised, but groundwork. I want to quickly ask a question. I'm sure everyone's gearing for T and to go, but why do you say in our region or around here we have resource limitations on chrome? I don't see that from my side, but what, why do you say that? Because you require five, six nurses. And really? Five, six nurses? To prone a Is it like four limbs? Not what just limbs, five, and six. <laughs> if you're in the room and manage the airway, you need three nurses to turn the patients. That's turn, very easy to get. I've turned big patients and it's a... Yeah, if it's a big patient, maybe. Yeah, the risk of pulling things out, you need someone to look after the lines. How many someone... nurses are on duty at any given ICU on any given day? Yeah, there are enough, but the point is you're taking five or six nurses away from five other patients. How long does it take to grow? It can take up to an hour. The primary nurse might need more time with you. It shouldn't take more than an hour. And the, the last few turners can just come for the turn. I don't think there's a resource on the I think that there's a, uh, this is what I think. Yeah. Because I've worked in two different units that have probed a lot of patients and it wasn't difficult. Once you get into the swing of things, it happens quite fast. You can do it. Well, okay, you can and we have. It. But I'm not advocating that we prone everyone in the unit. And let me just tell you, once a patient is prone, it's pretty much hands off, isn't it? And there's a lot of resources. <laughs> And you it's have to be prepared work. to turn the patient supine if they become unstable at a moment's notice. We used to go into ECMOs with four people in the room. Yeah. I, yeah. I really feel like um, we should make a big ape for friend. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, the data in the correctly chosen patient yeah. is very compelling. Yeah, it's almost half, um, the results are almost 50% better mm. with friend. The caveat with that study is that it was a very tightly selected group. The exclusion criteria was significant. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely can. But I really think you could start around or get to a patient say, okay, let's plan a prone in an hour's time. The primary nurse can start getting everything ready and then the actual prone takes how long? Ten minutes. <laughs> That's, That's a surgical ten minutes. Really? Sure, I've more patients than you guys. <laughs> 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 I'm not making it up. No, no, we need to get the program for our patients' sake. Practice, we need practice then. If you feel like we need practice, then practice. But we need to do it. I, I think it's, it's great to talk about prone, but it is intimidating when you first do it. Mm. Um, and all you need is one extubation or one included tracky or one line and then everybody's anti it so i think that's the big thing yeah and the other point with like you said those studies are, are in a very tightly selected group of patients and i think you know in order for us to do something we've got to follow those rules yeah and it's like ecmo we can't sort of make our own rules yeah um, if we want to get good outcomes. Because those are very patients, good outcomes. How many outcomes. patients have we proned in the last year? Uh, I wouldn't, I haven't. So we've probably missed an opportunity. 
And that should be the thing that puts you off. You need, not a friend, a friend, you, need, you need somebody who's enthusiastic to oversee it. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, someone's got to, it's like, they've got to drive it because you can see there is a reticence for good reason. Um, so I think if one's going to do it, you need to have, you need to have enthusiasts, yeah. like with all of these interventions. You can decide, well, I'm not going to do ECMO, it's too much like hard work and I will die. Or you can say, well, if we're going to do ECMO, we've got to, and I think framing is very much, uh, uh, and of course, and when you see the catastrophe, it does flavor out the way we practice. Uh, okay, patients also yeah. should yeah. affect the way you practice, not just the age Yeah. <laughs> I think branding was sort of fantastic during COVID, yeah. especially in the patients. Oh, yeah. It was amazing how mm -hmm. much better they Absolutely. And it um, works. Yeah. <laughs> the, the caveat also is it has to be, you can't do it for a couple of hours. Like mm -hmm. most of these studies, you know, they're doing it for 24 hours a day. Yeah, I'll turn for us now. So yeah, it has to be for extended periods of time. Where did your patient get the pressure sore? Uh, it wasn't at this hospital. Was it, was where on the body? On the face, from a CPAP yeah. mask, oh, okay. on the nose, I think. We had on the face. So it had a CPAP mask on and probe. Yeah. Okay. And an awake patient, so yeah. Mm -hmm. well, okay. Not intubated. Are there any more questions? Is there anything in our chat? Nothing. I'll ask the people attending online. Yeah. So close. <laughs> okay. Cool. Oh, okay. Um, I think, uh, thank you for everybody to attend our uh, mortality or mobility mortality meeting. I realize that there's lots that we can learn from each uh, patient. There's, um, so that's not that each day dying game because you know, we along the process that we can always learn something. And the main purpose is actually to help the next patient. We can provide a better care. Now that's our ethos in JJJ. Now with Renee, and Renee as our main coordinator and um, she's doing... Just, just sit on the chair, please, don't you? She is doing a... <laughs> Sorry. Okay. She, she, she is doing a fantastic job uh, within our group in terms of teaching and with her wealth of experience with nursing up in Mill Park and we're really grateful to have her. Every single time I really would like to express our gratitude because our work is only part of us. But I think continuation of sharing our knowledge and providing care is our key. And we must uplift as a whole, as a community, especially in Marisburg, and hopefully you can go outwards. And thank you for attending. And I think breakfast is going to be served at the back. I can only smell food, but <laughs> thanks for attending. And then I'm sure uh, Renee will keep us updated for the next uh, meeting. Thank you.